Guys, lovely to have you with us today. Um, we're going to get straight into this. Uh, we're doing a series in that great chapter, John chapter 17, the prayer that Jesus prayed just prior to the cross. We're recognizing that this was real deathbed talk, and on your deathbed, you don't talk about superficial things. You talk about the things at the end of the day that really count. So Jesus is praying, and his prayer is for three different aspects. He prays for himself as he knows he's about to go through the trauma of the cross. He prays for his disciples, and then he prays, lastly, for us, the, the church. I find that incredible, that just prior to this cruel death, Jesus finds himself not praying selfishly that God would relieve him of the pain and the pending suffering, but he finds himself praying for you and me. So I would invite you to turn with me to the last part of this particular prayer as we slowly bring this series to a close. I want to read to you from verse 25, and this is Jesus speaking to his Father about us. He makes a very specific request. He says, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me, let me say it again, in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Guys, this is a, a great passage and in the broadness of the context of the subject of, of love, I, I'm hoping just to narrow it down to hopefully give you just a, a couple of, of truths. One of them that uh, I will share has been a particular revelation to me as we've been sitting with the pastors and I've spoken to everybody on this particular subject over the course of this last week. And people who work here are tired of me asking questions as to what they think on this particular subject. But I have something that, that I hope uh, will be meaningful for you today. I've entitled this sermon, This One Thing. And Chantel brought it out so beautifully by way of introduction to say you can have all of the other stuff but if you do not have love, you have nothing. You know, you know where I get that from. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, If I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not love, I am nothing. If I can prophesy, if I can perform miracles, if I give my body to be burned, if I, if I give away all my, my stuff away to the poor, but if I do not because, do it because of love, it is Nothing. And at the end of the day, when we stand before God, He will say to us, Man, you look so good. You were incredibly impressive in all the stuff that you did, but I'm afraid it adds up to nothing, which is nothing. Love has to be the central focus. And this one, th one thing thing comes from a, a, a conversation that Jesus had with a, with a young man. We call him the rich young ruler, for want of a better name. And this rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I'd really like to go to heaven. Can you tell me how to get there? And Jesus said, well, you know, you've got to fulfill the law. You've got to keep the Ten Commandments. And this young man, in his, in his arrogance almost, he says, well, Jesus, I've done that. I have done it actually to perfection. I have done everything that I think you want me to do according to the law. And Jesus' heart broke for this passionate young man. And he said to the young man, indeed you have, you have done well. But this one thing you lack. Go sell all you have and come and follow me. And the young man said, no, that, that's just too hard to do. And Jesus would have said, no, the only thing that's hard to do right now is the hardness of your heart to do it. He said, this one thing you lack. Now Jesus has nothing against people with money. But he does have problems with people with money who put their money before Jesus. And that's where this young man fell. You see, it's all about who do you love or what do you love the, the most. And so it's this one thing, this love that we should have for God and then for one another that I want to just scratch the surface of today, if that's okay. I'm going to do it under, under three headings. First of all, I want to individualize what this love should look like by way of defining it as love defined. So let's define in a practical term what this love that God is talking about actually looks like in the life of, first of all, an individual. We move on from there in a moment. I want you to turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And just from verse 4, you will notice that, that he turns this love into an incredibly practical thing. We often use this passage in the context of marriages. 
Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, never do love, I am nothing. And then he gets incredibly practical, and he takes us what could almost be look like an idealistic, philosophical concept, and he turns it into deep practicality. There are a number of aspects that I wish we could preach an entire sermon on each one. But for the purpose of today, I'm just going to rush through them and define each of them very, very quickly. The first thing when we look at love defined as in verse 4 is love is patient. Love is patient. Number one, patience. I'm not big on patience myself. Patience in this context is the capacity to endure difficult circumstances and situations and people without becoming proud or provoked and respond in a negative way. I love that definition. I'm going to say it again. This is what it says. Patience is the capacity to endure difficult circumstances, situations, and people without becoming provoked, proud, and therefore to respond in a negative way way. You see, we have to have the end in mind. And if we have the end in mind as to what this picture of what God wants us to look like, it'll help us to become a little bit more patient because we'll be able to see past the superficiality of the now to see the then which God would want for us to do. This is what Jesus did. And when he was hanging and before he hung on the cross, he was provoked by Pilate. He was provoked by Caiaphas. He was provoked by the people who grabbed him and took him out of the Garden of Eden. And Jesus, despite being provoked so terribly, had patience with each of those provocations. Why? How did he do it? How was it that Jesus was able to stand in the garden and have these reckless people beat him and take him and chain him and talk to him and throw him down dungeons and put him and falsely accuse? How was he able to stand quiet in absolute patience under that provocation? I don't know about you. We have provocations far less than that. But it's for me. I respond immediately. It's proud and provocative and in a, in a negative kind of reactionary sort of a way. Jesus never did that because he knew that he had the end in mind. All the provocation that came to him in the garden, he knew he had the cross in mind. He said, be patient with this because I know the cross. And when he got on the cross and they beat him and they crucified him and they stuck a spear in his, in his mind, in his, in his heart and he, in his mind, he's thinking to himself, endure this, be patient with this suffering on the cross because in the end I know that I have the eternity and resurrection in mind. It's all about what you have at the end in mind that will help you to become more patient in the now. So the first one is that of, of patience. The next aspect that we read in 1 Corinthians 30 is kindness. The Bible has a lot of positive things to say about people who show kindness. I love the verse in Proverbs 90 that says, He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and will therefore be rewarded by the Lord. He who is kind to the poor. The Bible says a lot about kindness. Let me just say this though. You know, at every stage in your life, it seems that we admire certain things more than, than others. When you're young, when I was young, I used to admire the strong and the good-looking and the talented. And you would always look at them and say, man, if only I could be like that. I don't do that anymore, but I did that back then. And I look at when we grow up a little bit, we looked at, we sort of, well, now I've grown out of, out of admiring the strong and the good-looking. Now I'm admiring the clever I'm looking at the clever people and saying, how do they make life work? And we have this sort of admiration for, for cleverness. And then we graduate out of, graduate out of that into saying, let me, let me look at success. How, what makes people successful? And we begin to, to sort of admire different characteristics as we go along. Now I'm an old man. And I look back and I think during those phases, that's what I used to admire. You know what I admire the most in people now? is the simplicity of kindness. I love it. But I see people being kind to people they don't have to be kind to. Kind to their workers, the people that work. But they speak with, with grace and they speak with dignity to people who, who don't have anything else to sort of offer them. I love this thing called kindness. Thirdly, it says love is not jealous. Well, I want to put this into a positive thing instead of saying is not something. Let me tell you what love is. Love is, if it's not jealous, it's certainly content. Love is content. When you're content, jealousy will be the furthest thing from you. And when we have this contentment, even though poor circumstances, we have a satisfaction that is found in the Lord, it's, it's a great thing. 
But tragically, in the culture of today, if you're in the corporate world or probably any other world, there's a doggy dog mentality out there that says there's nobody going to stand up for me until I stand up for myself. There's a doggy dog world out there that says only the strong survive and I will not find contentment until I have everything that my heart desires. And it's only the tough survive and I'll trample on whoever I have to trample on in order to climb the corporate ladder. And there is a sense of discontent that is bred into our world and into the way that we think. And we do it from a child. We teach our kids, I'm the king of the castle. <laughs> You're the dirty rascal. You know, we have this thing that we have to be bigger and higher than people in order to understand contentment. But people who understand love in this context are indeed incredibly content. Number four, love is based around humility. Love is humble. Love is kind. Love is kind. Let me read to you about Jesus' humility. If you turn to Philippians, if you will. Philippians chapter 2 says this. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. I wonder what the angels thought about that when they saw God as Jesus coming down to this earth and being born in a stinking stable and being abused of people and just being a normal carpenter's son. And they were said, why would you do that, Jesus? You're the son of God. But Jesus humbled himself, we read. It says, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. And he became obedient to death, even death on a, a cross. It's because of this humility that Jesus was able to hang around with the people that he hung around with. You find it intriguing that you read the Gospels and you see the people that Jesus spent time with. He was so humble that he could spend time with tax collectors and sinners of ill repute. Other people never did that. They stood at a distance and they judged those people. Jesus was so humble that he could spend most of his time and spent the poor and the downtrodden and those suffering from the injustice and the abuse of power of, of other people. Jesus hung around with, with them. It was this humility of Jesus that without even a question, he could hang around with, with kids. He could hang around with people who had no value to add to anybody else's life. Jesus spent so much time with them. And you know how he did it? It was because he understood true humility, selflessness, emptying of self. We want to build ourselves up. We want self-esteem. Jesus killed self. And how many times have we said in this church that the only good self is a dead one? And the reason that we react and respond to so many different provocations is because the self is still so much alive and incredibly well. Humility. Humility. This guy, his name is Joseph Lamb. Let me just draw you another little picture over here. Joseph Lamb came up with a, with a concept, and he, he said this. If you're at a starting point over here, and this is where you want to get, so this is the point of what we would call, let's just call it success, and here you start. Joseph Lamb suggests that there's three phases through which you will have to go before you can get to success. He talks about, first of in your journey, he says you're going to have to go through the valley of humility. This is the valley of humility. And he said, before, before you go anywhere, you've got to learn what it means to be, be humble. These are the people in life who really have something of value to add. He says, but then you come out of the valley of humility, and you have to climb the path of patience, and you're not making much progress on this direction, but your character is certainly developing as you have to climb the hill of patience. And then when you come down from the hill of patience, he says there's a very long journey of perseverance, and you get into the path of patience, and then out of the path of patience, you become the barren plain of perseverance. It's a long haul. He says this is the cycle of life, and for people who build character, this is the way they do it. Wouldn't it be so cool if we could just start down here and go straight up to success up here? with none of this other stuff in between. But that'd be cool, but it's not like that, is it? He's absolutely right. Don't fight 
the valley of humility. It's a great place from which to develop. And then number five, he says this, love is not rude, which actually means simply love is courteous. Courteous. Love is courteous. Is that spelled right? I hope so. Whatever. No, there's an R in there. Okay, just testing. I didn't know that. Love, love is very courteous. Love is good manners. Love is very good, good manners. And you can tell the greatness of a human being by how they treat the little people. I've said that many times in the course of my time here. You can measure the greatness of people not by how they treat the big guys and the big dogs and the guys with the money. You can tell the greatness of a person by how they treat the people who could add nothing to their lives. How we treat the poor how we treat the people who look after our cars, how we treat the people in the street, how we treat the people across the teller when we're standing, we're frustrated, and they're exhausted. And, and how we treat those people is the measure of greatness. The measure of greatness is not found in sitting at the table of kings and prime ministers. The measure of greatness is seen as you find out how to, how to live with the little people and add value to their lives. And by little people, I'm not just talking about children. I'm talking about the people who, who can't add anything to your life and how you were able to, to draw alongside those people and, and be courteous and show them great dignity. When we d- discourteous, you know, all it simply is is a poor imitation of strength. We find somebody less than us, less in this sense, and we think, well, I can lord it over this person. It makes me feel a lot better the smaller they become. People who understand love are incredibly courteous. People who understand love are unselfish. Unselfishness. You know, selfishness is the root of immaturity. We see that in a child. A child wants something, and if you don't give it him, what does he do? He has a temper tantrum, and he'll lie down and kick and scream. Why do we think that's cute? Because he's immature. He's just a, a child. But the same trend could pass through life with each one of us. And selfishness is just, is just the root of immaturity. I don't get what I want. And if I don't get what I want, I'll just have a temper tantrum. I won't lie on the floor and kick and scream anymore, but I'll do something else to you. I'll either sulk or I'll be mean or I'll be sarcastic or I'll do something else. I'm having the same thing as a kid. I'm just doing it in a more adult way. And we do it exactly for exactly the same reason. It's basically immaturity. He says this love is not irritable or resentful. I love that. Love it doesn't have explosions. Love is self-controlled. Have you noticed who's controlling here? Self-controlled. You're in control. It's self-control. It's controlling yourself. You can't ask God to help you with this. God says, it's not my job. If you're prone to anger... And if you're prone to explosions, and if you're prone to meltdowns which alienate people, I have to tell you people, there's only one person to blame, and it's you. It's you. It's a lack of self-control. God will never control you. He's not up there with some little remote control thing saying, turn left, turn right. Whoops, stop there, move on. He didn't do that. God says, you're in control of yourself. So that puts a whole lot of responsibility into our sort of, portfolio, doesn't it? And your response at the end of the day is, you know what it is, your responsibility. I love that little saying. Let's move on. Love does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. I put this under the cover, covering of, of courage. You know, it doesn't rejoice at wrong. The world rejoices at wrong and wants you to rejoice along with them. The world would want you to, to take on their values and elevate those things. It's a very courageous person who can stand against the prevailing wisdom of the day. It's a very courageous person who can see that stuff for what it is. And the world is trying to put this stuff on you. It's like that Daniel, when he was with his little buddies in, in, in Persia, and they were being told to eat the food of the, of the kings. And he knew in his conscience that that was not right. And against the prevailing wisdom of the day that says, Daniel, you're in a privileged position. Use this position. Abuse this position. Take everything you can. And he says, no, 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 no. He says, I know what's right and what's wrong. And even though the majority may say that that's right, it doesn't mean it always is. And he stood with great courage 
against the prevailing wisdom of the day. And he says, I won't touch that stuff. I may only be one person. And there might be a few of my buddies who will stand against that. But we will define according to our conscience before God what is right and what is wrong. And it is a courageous person because of love who's able to do just that. And then the last one I would put under the covering of this thing called fortitude. I, I like the fact that um, Michael Cassidy uses this word. Fortitude just means that, that the ability to persevere, the ability to hang in there when it's tough. And to hang, it's like running the comrades' marathon. Those people that run that stupid race are people who have great fortitude. They have the ability to hang in there. They have the ability to overcome the tests that come along of thirst and depression and, and discouragement and, and all those kind of things. Those are the fortitude people who make things happen in life that pleases God because they love God. It's a mental toughness. It's a toughness that enables us to pass the tests of life, of which the greatest test of life is the test of time. How many of you are still going to be walking with Jesus in 10 years' time? <laughs> I wish I could tell you. But I would surmise that there will be quite a large percent of you that may have jacked out by then. You may become a disillusion by something that's happened in the church. You may have become despondent about the fact that God may not have answered your prayers as you would like them to be answered. And you, you, you think to yourself, this is not what it was cut out to be. And I would tell you that many of you will not be walking with Jesus. I'm not being depressed. I'm just being real. I've been in the church for a long time now. In this church over 21 years, and I meet people in town who, who have been part of this church for a period of time and no longer even walk with the church. Never mind walk with Jesus. They had no fortitude. They never passed the tests, the test of attitude, the test of, of all those different things, and they certainly have not passed the test of time. I wonder if you will. I certainly plan to. Certainly plan. It's in my thing because I have an end in mind, and I will take the tests that come along because I want to finish the race really well. So we have them. Patience, kindness, contentment, humility, courteousness, unselfishness, self-control, courage, and fortitude. What I want to do now is I want to tell you a little story. And as I'm telling the story, I want you to begin to tick some boxes here as these things come up in my little story. The story is of a great man. His name was Job. And you know his story in the Bible. But I love the story of Job because as I tell the story, you'll begin to see, hey, the unselfishness of Job. You begin to see the humility of Job, and you begin to see what made him so special in God's eyes. Now, Job is actually one of the oldest books in the Bible. It should come sort of just after Genesis if it was done chronologically because it's told of a man who lived many, many years ago. And one day, the picture is painted for us in, in, in the Bible of, of, of a meeting that took place in heaven. And God is on the throne. He calls all his angels to a meeting. And he notices that Satan is amongst the angels. He was the fallen angel. And so God addresses Satan and says, Satan, you're here. Have you seen my man Job who lives down there on the earth? He is righteous in all his ways. That didn't mean he obeyed the law in every, every jot and tittle. It wasn't that. It was that he just loved God. He didn't understand, perceive God maybe the way we do. But he knew God and he loved him. And God said to Satan, check my man Job. I have roamed the whole earth and there is no one like Job. He is righteous in all his ways. And Satan stands there. He's probably chewing gum, and he says, yeah, the only reason he's, he loves you is because you planted a hedge of protection around him. If you took that hedge down, I bet you he would curse you to your face. So God says, okay, I'll take the hedge of protection down. You can go and do anything you want to him, but you cannot take his life. And so Satan smiles. He goes down to the earth, and within a day, Job's life fell apart. He got the news that his camels and his sheep had been burned and stolen. He got the news that his whole business had collapsed. He got the news that his, his children had been killed in a terrible accident in the house and the wind had blown and fallen down. And he lost all of his, he lost it all in a day. And Satan stood back and he watched this. He thought, I wonder what his response is going to be now. But Job began to unfold in his life the beauty of these attributes. He didn't get angry. He just said, the Lord has given <laughs> and the Lord has taken away. Hey, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a great attitude. That's a great attitude. And then all of a sudden, during the time, he had three friends. And this perpetual pain and suffering came upon Job. And these three friends came and they tried to supposedly bring comfort to Job by telling him, Job, you must have sinned. 
and God is judging you, Job. And Job says, I have a clear conscience. I don't know what, I, what you're talking about. I have nothing to say between me and God. I have a clear conscience. And the people began, these three friends began to do it. And then it didn't work. Job remained faithful to God. And then there's another meeting in heaven. And God sees Satan and says, Satan, it didn't work, hey? And Satan says, oh, the reason it didn't work was because you still gave him good health. If you took his health away, he would curse you to your face. So God says, go again. He goes again. He puts terrible boils upon Job's whole body. And Job is sitting in the ashes with a piece of pottery, and he's scraping these boils. He's in absolute agony, and his wife is telling him, Job, just curse God and die. These three wannabe friends are telling Job, you have been judged. You're, you're living out. This is the consequence of your sin. And he continues to say, no, I don't believe so. I believe I love God so much. We have this good relationship. And, and, and they continue to pour out judgment upon him. Eventually, Job, after all his pain and his suffering, he has a conversation with God. It is the most amazing conversation. And if I were to sort of put it in our language, you say, God, I don't really understand this. I don't think there's any sin that you would be judging right now. But God, I'm confused. And God speaks in the storm to Job. And Job repents for just even questioning God. And then the end of the story is so beautiful. And that Job forgave his friends who brought that judgment and that ugliness toward him. They called himself friends, but they weren't friends. And Job forgave them. And the end of the story is so beautiful that God restored to him double that he ever had financially. And he gave him seven more kids. And Job lived for another 140 years after that. And he died an old, old, but deeply content man. That's a great story. As I told the story, did you pick up on these things? Pick up on his patience. Then arrive at conclusions too quickly. Pick up on his kindness. If those friends, you would see how many conversations he had with his friend. If one of them had had a conversation with me, I said, get out of here. But he, for, he, he forbore them, and, and he was so content in the situation. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Even, even if he takes it all away, I will still serve him. You see, his contentment was not based upon circumstances. His contentment was based upon his relationship with God. His absolute humility to be able to deal with the issues. His courteousness, the way he spoke with these ugly friends of his. His unselfish to be able to continue. His self-controlness, incredible. What about his courage and his fortitude? He's, he finished the race and he finished really, really well. So when you look at how this beautiful man loved God, you cannot help but be impressed. That's the fortitude and the beauty of the fruit for an individual. I can't do this for you. You can't do it for me. We all do it for ourselves. Let's move on. That's for the individual. Let's talk about this corporate aspect of this thing called love. I want you just to watch this little um, interview with Damien Williams, who I'm sure many of you know. I heard Damien do a talk at the Prefix Leadership Camp this last week, and I was so blown away by the story that he told and he gives you just the facts here on, on the screen. Just watch this for a minute or two. Yeah, my name is Damien Williams, and uh, I work at Port Chepstone High School. I've been there for uh, about 20 years as a, as a teacher and sort of five years as a student. And uh, uh, when I was in matric, um, when I was 17 years old, uh, in about half past five in the morning, we just heard it huge sort of crash of plates and uh, I rushed through to the kitchen and um, my father was was lying on the floor um, he'd had a heart attack at the time um, and we sort of called out the ambulance and uh, unfortunately he passed away um, and I sort of went to school the next day um, we, we had the English orals on and we had a drama production at the time um, and I had to be there um, on the Thursday, we'd sort of planned to do the, the funeral. And uh, I sort of remember going down to the office uh, and sort of signing out with Mrs. Thompson, who was there. Um, and the church that we go to was just down the road from the school. Um, and I, I sort of remember in, in the sort of 800 meters walk thinking how sad this, this funeral is going to be because it's... It's just going to be me and my mom and my sister and um, 
sort of my, my dad didn't know anyone. He was a, a security guard at, at Fresh Meat at the time. And so he, he sort of didn't know anyone outside of work. And my mom sort of kept to herself. And I thought to myself, this is going to be sort of a very sad funeral. Um, and I met my friend Charles outside. And we, we just had a short discussion about things. And he just sort of gave me a few words of encouragement. And then I sort of got to, I remember getting to the church door. And I remember opening the door. And I remember just seeing just maroon blazers um, because although no one knew my father, no one knew my uh, sort of my parents and my family, um, a lot of the school um, children had come out um, for no other reason but to support me. Um, and there were friends of mine, there were people who just, knew me as acquaintances um, and they they were just all present and had come to support me emotionally and just be there for me and it it had it made such a difference in my life i always give the talk at the at uh, our, our prefix camp um, and still to this day uh, i think sort of this, i think it's i've done it 18 times i always still uh, get quite emotional um, telling that story because it, it it brings back those memories of just uh, being so grateful for people who just out of the the kindness of their heart or the love of their hearts just coming to support people that's that's the power of community and when he did this talk uh, it, it was he did it so emotively to say the day his dad died they have to go to the funeral a little while later, and he didn't think anybody was going to be there. But he opened the door, he said it was just maroon blazers. He didn't know he was so loved. He didn't know that people even cared about him. And just the fact that they stood there with him at his darkest hour, they didn't know him, they weren't his best friends, but people, that's the power of love in a community. It changes people. It makes people take up and sit up and take notice of the power. And Jesus put it like this in John 30. He says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. It's not if you have all the miracles that do all the things that build big buildings as much as those are nothing wrong with those things. But if you have not loved, the world will never know the truth of who I am. It's by love in the community of believers, in the community of Christians that makes this thing worth noting. The reason that we have to show love, Jesus says, is that it is a testimony to the world about the beauty of God's love for us being seen as God's love through us to other people. If we don't have this people, listen carefully, we have nothing. If we sit in judgment of people and we sit with prejudices and ugly thoughts in our hearts about people and issues, is that we have nothing that will attract the world. You can build the biggest buildings in the world, sing the most beautiful music in the world. It means zip. It means nothing if we do not show love to one another. Let me move on. I had a whole lot more to say on that. I was going to tell you about the church in Acts. Acts chapter 2 had evidence this incredible love. I need to say this. Go and read Acts chapter 2. Just a couple of verses describe the church. It says that the church, they used to meet together, all of them. It wasn't like those with this economic value, those with this kind of job, and those with this. Everybody met together. In the real church, there is no barrier of, e of inequality between people because we understand we're all equal in the eyes of God. That's the first thing. The second thing is that they ate together. Something happens when we eat together. I love it. I, uh, you can see I love it. We, we, we eat together. We fellowship. We worship together. We, we talk together. We, we spend time together. In the beauty of that community called the church. Why do they do that? Because they love one another. You know why they love one another? Have a look at the verse prior to the verse that talks about the church. It says, they were all in awe of God. When you're in awe of God, you will begin to see people very differently. The issues that separate people do not become issues anymore when you see the, in, stand in awe of who God is, when you see the magnificence of who God is, when you understand and comprehend personally the love of God, you will see people, people, so differently. 
because you'll begin to see people through God's eyes. And you begin to relate to people through the character of God because He is in you. And when you see Him and you stand in awe, that will be your response. So we've done that. Individually, we've spoken about love. Corporately, we could say so much more. But lastly, one cannot talk about love without talking about this thing we call tough love. Tough love. This is the toughest part of the sermon. And I'm nervous to share this with you. I thought about this and I've spoken to a few folk and their wisdom and they've shared some thoughts with me. You know, when you talk about love, one of the aspects of love would have to be forgiveness. We have to forgive if we say that we love. But here's an interesting thing. I cannot forgive people who have not wronged me. Jesus says this in the Lord's Prayer. You know, he talks about the fact that, that we, need a, we need to love one another. We need to forgive one another. Forgive us our trespasses as what? As we forgive those who trespass against us. I can only personally forgive those who trespass against me. Now, that was a revelation to me. Because I see people hurting people, and I think I've got to forgive those people for hurting people that I love. Apparently not. I can only legitimately forgive people who have wronged me personally. I cannot forgive people for you. You know, somebody wrongs you, somebody messes up your life. I can't forgive them. Let me tell you what I have to do. You know what tough love says? Tough love is confrontational. Tough love is, is in your face. You're not going to like this. But when I see people who hurt people, and if I see people who abuse children, and that for me is the grossest of things, when I see people who take out sexual issues on children and, and abuse in any way those little guys, I, something rises up and said, this is wrong. This is wrong. And I battle to forgive that guy. But according to the passage in the Bible that I'm reading, we don't have to forgive him. But we do have to do this with him because I cannot forgive that man on behalf of that child because he hasn't wronged me, he's wronged the child. So you say, well, well, how do I show love to the man who has abused the child? This is tough love. First of all, there are five things that you have to have. Very quickly, I'll give them to you. The first thing that needs to rise up within you is a righteous indignation, a righteous anger at what is taking place. You've got to get really angry with what that person is doing to the person who is vulnerable and the person who is being hurt. And when that anger rises up within you, it's a righteous anger. Jesus showed this. He got angry with those who made a mess up around the temple, ripping the poor people off, selling them stuff at exorbitant prices to go and make a sacrifice. Something rose up with Jesus and Jesus was righteously angry. And he made a whip and he turned those tables. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, turning tables. Righteous indignation rose up within Jesus that day. The second thing that comes out of righteous indignation is those people who have wronged the people you love need to be rebuked. Stay with all the R's here. They need to be rebuked. Somebody need to tell them, you can't do that. I have something inside of me that hates bullying. I have it since a child. It got me into so many fights standing up for people. I got myself beaten black and blue at school because something inside of me said, that's not right. And I seem to have this drawing towards the underdog that got me into so much trouble because I couldn't bear it to see the abuse of somebody else's power. And it would, it would drive me absolutely crazy. I don't know about you, but this holy, righteous indignation that that's an abuse of power, and it gets you into a lot of trouble, but it needs to lead to a rebukeness of the person who has done wrong. The third thing that has to be done is that person who has been rebuked needs to be given the opportunity to repent. You have to tell them, you have wronged these people, and in my love, I am angry with you, and I am upset with you because you have hurt somebody who doesn't deserve that, and I can't ask you to forgive me because you haven't wronged me, but I am asking you to repent for the hurt that you've caused that person, and we need to ask them and tell them, you need to repent, and then after the rebuke and the repentance comes, hopefully a restoration, that if they re respond to the rebuke, and if they respond to repent by repenting, then it can lead ultimately, hopefully, to restoration, and then it will ultimately lead to release. But what happens, people, listen, what happens if you get righteously indignant over a particular thing? You rebuke the person over the particular thing that he has done to hurt somebody else, and they do not repent. You know what you do? You don't judge them. You don't badmouth them. You just release them. In the book of 1 Corinthians, there's a man who has an incestuous relationship with his, with his father's wife. 
And the church gets to hear about it. And Paul comes along and hears about it in the church. And he says, why are you not angry about this? Why is this man still sitting in the fellowship when he is so grossly sin? I know sin is sin, but there is some sin that is more sin than other sin. And this is one of them. And there's public consequence to this kind of thing. And so he gets really angry. Paul says, why have you not cast this man out? Why are you sitting condoning his sin? This is wrong. And it's like a cancer will grow within the church. He says, you need to rebuke that man. Give him an opportunity to repent. And then if he does, restore him. But this man did not repent straight away. And then, you know, Errol helped me with this this morning. And then in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, you have the story again. Paul refers back to it. 1 Corinthians, he's telling you about the man. Get angry with him. Rebuke him and get him out of there. And in, in the 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, okay, the man has now repented. I hear that he has repented of his sin, and now you must restore him back into the church again and release him not to God to judge him, but you release him back into further ministry. That's what love does, and it's tough love. Who said love was for wimps? <laughs> I hate that. But I cannot forgive people who hurt you. You've got to do that. But when people hurt you unrighteously, some inside me rises up and says, that's wrong. That's wrong. That person, have a look. Have a look at David when he messed up with Bathsheba. Who came to him? Nathan the prophet knocked on his door and said, David, I have a story to tell. He tells him the story about the sheep. And David says, well, who is this man? I'm angry. And he turns his finger and says, David, you are the man. And David, we read, after he had had the righteous indignation of Nathan, the prophet coming to him, who rebuked him. David heard the story and immediately he fell from his throne and he repented and he was restored and he was released back into his kingship role. Compare that with Saul. <laughs> Saul went to the witch of Endor and he says to the witch, I want to, I'm in a problem, I need to find out what the future looks like. And he did wrong. The prophet came to him. And said to him, hey, Saul, you have done wrong. I'm angry with you. God wants you to know he's very angry with you. And he rebukes you. And you need to repent. But Saul, King Saul would not repent. And so he was never restored to his kingship. He lost his kingship to David. And he was released to the judgment of God. That's love. You say, is that loving? Apparently it is. It's under the covering of love that this tough love needs to take place. People, does this make sense? Because I, I really think we need to up our game on what we call love. I think we do. Isn't it the same with us very quickly? God gets angry with our sin. He rebukes us for our sin. He gives us an opportunity to repent through the death of Christ. He then, on the basis of our repentance, says you can now be restored and released into the ministry of sonship, not slaveship. And we could do that. But if at this particular point we do not repent, we're in trouble, people. Because then God knows there's no restoration without repentance. And there's no releasing back into ministry until you've been restored because you need to repent. I don't know about you. But you need to fit this into your calendar of thinking. Where are you in this whole deal? I want to pray right now in closing. But I just want to close with asking the question, man, we've set ourselves a high ideal. Let me tell you this. Before you start doing this stuff and, and rebuking people and telling them to repent and restore, before you start doing this, you better do this. Because there's nothing more hypocritical than somebody coming to someone and saying, I'll rebuke you and I re you need to repent when I know that you have a log in your own eye. And Jesus says, before you go to your brother and tell him this, before you go and tell him this, you better make sure you've taken the log out of your own eye before you try and take the speck out of his. Because the ultimate in hypocrisy would be that, that you would, without living this, begin to do this. So be very careful. Manage this thing with great care. We said ourselves, how do we do this? It's a tall order. And I preached an ideal sermon, meaning not a good sermon in the way it's been preached, but it preaches to a a very high ideal of agape kind of love. And I need to ask you today, how do we love like that? Well, the passage in closing says this, that the love you have me for me may be in them. You'll never pull off this without Jesus. You do know that. No one can be good in goodness without Jesus. 
Chantal made that point today as well. You've got to have Christ in you by the power of His Holy Spirit before you're enabled to live like this. Now, some of you need the Holy Spirit to be given to you because you don't have Him, because you don't have a relationship with Jesus. I'm not being ugly. I'm telling you the truth. That until you come to Christ in repentance and say, God, I agree with you. That's all repentance is. I agree with you that I have sinned. And I want to now follow you. And God there takes your sin away from you and gives you the Holy Spirit. Maybe you need that today. This could be a good day for you. But others amongst us who have received Christ through salvation, all we need to do now is live in the acknowledgement of the presence of God within us. We've asked God to come into our lives. You know what? He will never turn you down. And He will come in and He will live in you. And we've just taken it for granted. We don't even believe it anymore. And so some of you need the Holy Spirit. Some of you just need to acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life in order to be able to live like this. Let's pray. God, I pray for these good people today that if there's anybody here that that needs your Holy Spirit for the first time, that they would come to you in repentance and acknowledgement that they need Jesus. They repent of their sin. They want to love you with all their hearts. They want to follow you. Guys, if there is anybody like that, won't you please connect with us during the course of this week? We would love to talk to you about that. But then I guess for the majority of us, we don't love like this because it's not that we don't have the Holy Spirit, it's just that we don't acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. Christ in me, that mystical union that enables me to live out a Christ-like life through the power of your Holy Spirit. Today, oh Jesus, thank you that you dwell within us. Forgive us, Lord, for not living as if that is the truth. We acknowledge it in our heads, but in our hearts we're thinking something else. How we need your power and your ability to love like this. This one thing. This one thing. Love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind and your strength. And then because you do that, you're able to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Thank you for this truth in Jesus' name. Amen.